If you're just joining us on Facebook or YouTube, I'll just do a quick introduction. Of course, this man needs no introduction and his music speaks for itself, I, I really think. But um, yeah, we got Patrick Bartley here today. We're very lucky to have him. Uh, he's a Grammy nominated saxophonist, composer, band leader. He's, you've seen him on Stephen Colbert's show. He's performed with Louis Hayes, Jonathan Baptiste, Mulgrew Miller, Jeff Cothan, uh, Wynton Marsalis. He also has a deep passion for J music, which uh, has made an appearance on the Emmett's Place show. And uh, he, he leads a J music group as well. And uh, he performs in a variety of different musical contexts outside of jazz and, you know, offshoots of jazz as well. So maybe he'll talk about that. Um, and I wanted to add to his resume, I think he got the unofficial if we had it, if we had a jazz awards of live from Emmett's place, he got the unofficial solo of the year award by the fans nominated. Um, wow. <laughs> I didn't realize that was a thing. Well, <laughs> no, it's, it's unofficial, but I think it's undeniable and everyone okay, agrees thanks. on the, wow. it got the most buzz. <clears throat> Man, it's <laughs> crazy. All the cats you got coming through, but thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to jump right into questions. If you're on the Zoom, you can throw questions in the Q&A section, not in the chat, everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll start off nice and easy. We, we have one person asking, what is your sax setup? Oh, perfect. So um, I play a Meyer 6 um, that I got from my friend, uh, <laughs> I see, and it's, like this is a perfect setup actually because um not not set up the horn but perfect setup to me talking about my setup because uh I'm not a sax nerd man like that's, that's gonna be one thing you're gonna know about me like I can show you my my four hundred dollar Bundy two tennis saxophone I got from the, the swap shop Emmett knows what the swap shop is <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> so, oh, yeah. you know I, I I picked up what I picked up again and just played it but now like you know this my I was playing on a bunch of different mouthpieces and then eventually I heard about the Meyer and then my friend Kyle uh. Kyle Poor, not Kyle Pool. It's actually hilarious. When I met Kyle Pool, I was like, "Huh." This is <laughs> but my friend Kyle Poor is a great piano player and a saxophone player. I think he, he he went to do something in the in the mathematics field uh, after after school. But he uh, he gave me this mouthpiece. At first, he let me borrow it, and he said, "Oh, you can just keep it." And I was like, "Wow, okay." So I've been playing this Meyer Six now for the past 12, 13 years now, and it's the only mouthpiece I've been playing. And um, I'm with I only play ligophone. Um, I'll take it off so you can see it. Um, I want everyone to be able to experience what Ligophone is and what they have to offer. Um, I'm not just saying this because I'm sponsored. I really do believe in these ligatures. Um, There's a Ligophone. There's a thin pad inside there. And that thin pad um, kind of creates a distance from the reed um, to the ligature. And it helps it, it helps like kind of color the vibrations in the overtones. So what this does for me is it allows me to play really freely, but also keep my warm sound at the same time. So before I was just playing on whatever, you know what I'm saying? We would take like rubber bands and put stuff around the reed. <laughs> we don't got no ligature, like, you know what I'm saying? And we would still learn how to play. You know, you should always learn how to play on, on you should learn how to play first, right? The equipment should not dictate how you play. But um, after finally figuring out like what I wanted to do, I started practicing on this good equipment. And Dana Stevens, um for those who don't know him i think was was dana on your show has Dana been on your show yet i don't remember not yet but not but yet. We're, we've talked and we're, we're planning something okay yeah yeah because dana's the the man and i love dana um but uh dana when, when i met him some years ago he he um told me about ligophone i was like what's that because i never really tried anything else so he said check out ligophone i was like okay so i put the ligature on my mouthpiece thinking like oh okay let's see what's gonna happen I had no idea how much of a difference it was going to make. <laughs> um, and also, you know, if you don't like giant companies and you like supporting kind of more um, kind of homegrown type businesses, then again, Ligaphone is a great kind of a, a smaller French company that's trying to grow their business abroad. And so I'm here being kind of a pioneer of that. <laughs> so I play Ligaphone reads and ligatures, and then I play um, a Yamaha 62 Um it's a newer one. So I know everybody's talking about purple label. I was like, the heck is purple? Label? I didn't even know what that was. So um, I just knew that the great Jeff Clayton gave me that horn uh, when I was 17. And, you know, rest in peace, one of the greats um, of the saxophone, period. And he's also the person that taught me, like, in one lesson, how to really project my sound. Um, so, yeah, I owe a lot to, to, to Jeff. And um, 
That's why I'm always playing this one, no matter what. <laughs> Patrick, so, it, was, yeah. it was so it was so funny that you showed up. For for those of you who don't know, I I went uh, into the recording studio a couple of weeks ago and had Patrick come play on the recording with with Sean Jones as a front line with Russell Woo! Russell and Kyle and I. It was a vision I had from from Emmett's place. Like, what would Patrick and Sean sound like together? Um, but Patrick shows up to the recording session with a brand new horn. He's like, "This is the first time I've ever played this horn." And, <laughs> you know, Sean's like, "Wow, man! Like, you showing up to a recording session with a brand new horn? That's a risky. That's a risky move." Um, Patrick is like, "No, nah, no, nah, it's not risky. I thought it sounded great, and I'm ready." Um, and I, th- I, and I, th- I thought that's something that 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 really stood out, stands out about you, is that. You know, it's 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 almost like the the story about Charlie Parker, where you know he'd be playing a plastic saxophone <laughs> that, he, that, that someone brought him because he had pawned his real one, but he sounded like Charlie Parker. And I think that the the real lessons in there, like you you sound like Patrick Bartley, no matter you, <laughs> no matter what you're playing. Uh, thank you, man. I don't know if I can go that far, but uh, yeah, <laughs> the one was a little more than plastic. <laughs> thank you, man. Yeah. You know, talking and you were talking about when you got that horn at 17. Uh, I, of course, we always get a lot of young musicians too, and up and coming musicians. Um, and one person's asking, Who did you transcribe? Uh, this is from Kyle Jordan. Who did you transcribe most when you first began transcribing? And when do I know I've really got it down for a transcription? <laughs> Man. Um, so the. <laughs> I know you asked as a two part question and the, that, that was the second part. I kind of want to answer it backwards um, because the when you really got it down part, man, that's like a <laughs> so the end goal with transcription is really just another form of practice. Like, I think I think people really kind of have it like the wrong idea with transcription. Like we always preach transcription as a way to get licks, but it's like. I don't know, and could probably <laughs> talk about this, too, but it's like how many licks do you actually play from all your transcribed solos on every solo? You know what I'm saying? Like you're not sitting there like playing all your, you're, you're not co- playing all your copied stuff. Like there's like techniques that stand out. You know what I'm saying? You're just like, Oh man, like this is going to kill it. And it might pop out every once in a while, but you're not like thinking about like, Oh, like over this, you know, Ahmad Jamal did this thing specific. So I'm only going to do this. Right. Cause I have these licks. It's like, no, you, you're transcribing so that you can get used to the feeling of playing jazz. That's the reason why we transcribe because like transcribing is such a, it's like a multivitamin, like a super pill, right? That's kind of what it is. Like you're, you're practicing scales, you're practicing uh, articulation, you're practicing phrasing, you're practicing lyricism, you're practicing like, you know, octave jump. You're practicing so many different things, tone, you know, like melody, rhythm. You're practicing so many th- different things at once from taking the finished product of that moment, not, fin- you know, if they're 27, like a bird's 27 was recording, that's not going to be the finished product of his life, but the finished product culminating up to that point in time you're taking that what he did how is it being processed and spoken about at this time on this recording you're able to kind of take that and experience it for yourself by transcribing that's basically what you do so in terms of when you got it you got it when you can play the solo like that's that's step number one like you know that there's no like you know if, if you're expecting to get some grand improvisational uh uh epiphany from transcribing then you're doing it wrong <laughs> that's not the reason why you transcribe it is that's not the reason why you should um but my point is is that when you can play the solo and you can feel some emotion from playing it and you can really feel like the the ideas being expressed in it then you got it but if if you mean like when do i got it as in when do i when am i able to play something that sounds like that well that comes from you living your own experiences that's why you have to play as much music as possible so to supplement your transcription um practice you have to also learn melodies of songs. You have to also learn riffs, backgrounds of like big band stuff. You have to learn different parts that people write down as well. You have to learn as much music as possible so that you can understand why they might've played that in that moment. But if you're only learning how to solo by transcribing solos, you're not gonna really get it because the whole point of being able to solo is to be able to make a melody sound like it was written. <laughs> like, you know, not li- some, you know, depending on the context, right? If you're playing free jazz, when it comes, you might not want to sound like that. But I'm saying the point is, when I say sound like it's written, it's supposed to sound like it's with intention. And if you don't understand how to play music with intent and with purpose, then you won't be able to improvise something that has intent and purpose. So that's the transcription is basically there to improve your technique and your musical conception. 
um, because you're learning how someone else did that exact thing. Um, so to me, that's that's, you know, no one's told me that before. This is my own thing. So you're not going to be able to, you know, if you go, you know, we, we, we talked about, you know, master father went Marsalis. He might disagree with me or whatever, because like he didn't tell me that. So I'm not telling you like, oh, yeah, I spent time with these people. And he told me, no, this is my synthesis. <laughs> this is my like summary of my experiences based on things that these people have told me um, and my experiences with them. And so that's why in terms of that, um, I wanted to answer that question backwards, because <laughs> that is a great question that. Um, I feel like swirls around in my head a lot, but I don't get a chance to really process it and think about it um, in that way. But to answer the first part of the question now, um, this is the first part of the uh, uh, the question. Uh, who did I start with? I don't want to make this story too long, but basically um, I had a social studies teacher um, in middle school. Her name was Edna Lucho. And uh, she was actually friends with Marcellus. I think she still is. Um, but this is back in. So for some of the younger ones in, in, in the chat, um, you know, we didn't have MP3s yet. I mean, I know they were coming out. They were, they were a file format, but we weren't walking around with iPods. So we went to like Sam Goody and FYE and bought CDs and stuff. And um, she, we did like a math field trip, <laughs> like mall math. We called it, I guess, something, something to get the kids out the classroom. And she said, and, and because she was a jazz musician, she knew a couple of us were jazz uh, students uh, with Melton Mustafa Jr. at the time. Said, hey, go pick up a jazz CD. So I went to the store. Um, into FYE or I forgot, I don't even know which one. It might've been Sam Goody or FYE, one of those places. Um, but I went in and I found a Kurt Whalen record. Cause I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is jazz on it. You know what I'm saying? And again, no, not to Kurt. Cause he's one of my favorite saxophone players of all time. So this next comment is not to him at all because he was the first, my first ever saxophone influence. And I love him. But when I brought the CD to, to, to her and again, no, not to her either, because she wasn't saying anything about him. She was like, man, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not, that's not the jazz that I'm talking about. Like, I'll, 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 let me, let me burn you something. Like, cause you wanted me to learn like traditional jazz. So she burned me a CD of 12, um, different songs from like all over. Right. So a lot of people start with, when they talk about jazz, like, Oh, you should start with bebop only, or you, you should start with such and such, or, or start with the twenties or start with the sixties. It was like, she had a CD where the first track was Louis Armstrong, cheek to cheek. The very next track, was Hank Mobley Soul Station. The very next track was John Coltrane Blue Train, and then it went to Louis Armstrong St. Louis Blues. Then it was like two tracks from Wayne Shorter Speak No Evil. It's like I, I didn't know the names of the tracks back then, but I I I knew them later as I looked them up, right? Because again, I couldn't. There was no there's no automatic metadata like find liner notes or whatever. Like I had to ask people what's this song, and then I finally found out. Okay, and I look it up and I put it in, you know, to the computer. But yeah, man, it was just like a complete like. It wasn't a straight line. It was just, <laughs> it was all over the place, a whole bunch of different types of music. So that was the first stuff that I listened to until I eventually kind of uh, uh, culminated uh, and focused all of my energy on uh, like Louis Armstrong first um, because I wanted to learn how to growl on clarinet. Because <laughs> I thought I was, I was playing clarinet first and I was like, oh, that's really cool. I want to learn how to do that. So I kept like kind of just screaming into the clarinet until I could finally get something that did not destroy my voice. Um, and then I got the Ken Burns Jazz Collection, which actually um, I got for my my 13th birthday, which kind of sent me like a chronological, almost basically a chronological order of their like their telling of the story of jazz. So I know a lot of people feel weird about that because it seems like it's biased or skipped over certain things. But I actually talk if you want to there's an interview I did with Sean Wallace, Dr. Thunder, where I talk about that specifically. You want to hear my thoughts on that in detail. Um, but I think there's nothing wrong with that. And I think they did a great job um, of telling a specific part of jazz that they felt like should have been told like the history of the, the part of jazz that people don't think about. Everybody loves listening to Wayne Shorter and Ornette Coleman and, 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 and Train, but they're just like, oh, they didn't spend enough time on him. Yeah, well, it's because at the time, Winton thought nobody knew or cared about Louis Armstrong. So I think it's great that he spent a lot of time on him and all that stuff. But that's kind of my point is that I learned a lot about that as a result. So I started kind of going to the beginning. And then my band director, Melton Mustafa, was like, okay, you playing saxophone, you should check out Charlie Parker. So he handed me the Omni book and I was just, that was the first saxophonist that I was obsessed with because listening to his recordings and also like the recordings that were all up a half step, like <laughs> I thought that all that stuff that was up a half step was the original key. And then I, I later realized actually a year later that it had perfect pitch, but that that's, it's kind of unrelated because basically my point is the way I felt about those keys, like crazyology, like the way it sounded and then drifting on the read. Anybody who, anybody who has perfect pitch, maybe in the chat might know that I'm singing it in B right now. That's because that's the first memory that the song stuck with me. And it was a certain nostalgic feeling. 
So I actually started trying to transcribe that stuff in that key, even though it was very difficult for me. <laughs> like I couldn't play. I couldn't play it at all. And then I looked in the Omni book and noticed that some of the keys were like a half step down. So I was like, which one is right? Like I didn't really know. But needless to say, that's kind of just a, a funny anecdote that that's that's not to say that I, I, I learned bebop up a half step. It just means that the reason why I got attracted to these recordings is because there was a certain magical and nostalgic feeling that the 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 morphed out of tune records gave to me for some reason it almost felt like it was like i was taking a trip back in time listening to it so it 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 made me feel attracted to the music as opposed to just like a homework assignment um and so i guess that's one of the reasons why i kind of got so enamored with charlie parker and that was the first person i started transcribing was him um as a result of that because i wanted to capture the feeling of nostalgia that he had i didn't want to just learn bebop and learn notes i wanted to learn you know i'm saying i wanted to learn like the the feeling that like why does he sound because like, you, you notice that like, he's playing the most killing stuff like on paper right it's like oh he's hitting all the approach tones and he's hitting all the blah 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 blah. why does he sound so different like why, like why does he like sound so peaceful why does it sound so like at home when you're listening to charlie parker play and that's that's to me what i got right i wasn't worried about the notes because i didn't know no theory i didn't know like advanced this and that that everybody knows because they look at youtube videos now <laughs> I, I, you know what i'm saying i didn't know that kind of stuff we had to go to books and ask teachers for that stuff. But now you can just find it at, like, at a click of a button. But I was like, man, this feeling. I don't know what this is, but I love it. And then, of course, that led me to Cannonball. Um, that led me to Cannonball Adley, who was from South Florida. So that was a nice anecdote, too. But Cannonball, it's, it's, basically, Bird and Cannonball were like my first people that I really wanted to get with. And to this day, they remain like the most consistent people that I'm like trying to emulate in my sound not really emulate that's the wrong word because i'm not trying to emulate anybody anymore but they're the people i'm constantly like kind of giving checkups to myself like do i really know how to play the saxophone i'm always thinking about them <laughs> so you can you can start with them and, and it's not a lot of people think like it's surface knowledge they're like well, what about these modern cats and blah 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 i was like yeah you should listen to everybody I, if you listen to me i appreciate it but like we're all going to tell you who we listen to and it's going to be like those cats so you know it's nice to get it from the source so that is is them <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry if that was long-winded. I know it's supposed to be a simple question, but... No, no, this is none of it simple. <laughs> Everything is, you know, this is, we're here for the details. Mm. I, I love this next question because um, I think that we all fall into this trap. Even maybe you still even fall into it, but maybe not. Um, how do you get out of the mindset of trying to impress other musicians while playing and improvising? How do I get into the mindset? Out, out it? of it. Oh, out of the mindset. You no, know, it can be very, you know, especially yeah. jazz can be kind of a cutthroat thing where people will be vibing each other or some people just feel insecure. And somebody's asking, how do you get out of the mindset of trying to impress other musicians in your solo? Well, I mean, <laughs> that's a, that's one of the things that, um, in terms of my long list of reasons why I kind of eventually came to, not like being in the, the the proper the jazz community like at large all the time was mostly because of this overwhelming feeling that you had to kind of be self-righteous all the time as opposed to being kind of just honest with yourself and, and your musical enjoyment because the funny thing about jazz is that like you didn't get into this music to to make money right like I hope you didn't like so it's like one of those things like it should be a a personal endeavor that because of the support of your community and because of the support of the people that love it, you end up making money, right? We're all helping each other. And to me, you can't, you can't be a part of that type of a thing if you don't love the music yourself. So to me, the solution to not play to impress other people is to just like the music that you play. <laughs> like, it sounds really stupid, right? It sounds like, man, that's not the answer I was hoping to get. I thought you were going to give me some crazy wisdom. It's like, well, no, I'm serious. The reason why I never cared about explicitly impressing everybody. Well, that's not true. There's like times where I'm just like, I feel like I got to play, play, play. But the reason why it never consumed me is because at the end of the day, like I told you that story from my social studies teacher, I heard music and I enjoyed the feeling of it. And from the very beginning, I didn't care about making sure that I was like better than these people or make sure that I was like trying to hear my licks and whatever. But also I didn't grow up with social media. So things are different now. We're always posting like minute clips and stuff on Instagram and stuff for people to see and like transcriptions and stuff. Um, I do that occasionally just like to show people what I'm working on and stuff, but not really, you know, I'm not doing that to get any kind of validation. <laughs> it's content, man. You know, we got to keep the grind up, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just being real with you. You ain't going to hear this real stuff from other people. Um, but 
uh, uh, I like the music. I love the music. That's the point. Like, I've never felt like I needed to prove myself to anybody but myself. Whenever I play, whenever I practice stuff, I'm never thinking about, like, other people and how they think about my stuff. Like, I, I, there's just music that I like and I want to hear it. So I need to practice so I can play the music that I hear. You know what I'm saying? That's the point. And I think everyone should be working towards that. And that's how you sound genuine. You know, if you sound, if you feel like you're playing stuff just to play it, then you probably are, you know, but if you feel like you're playing something and you feel some emotion from it, then that's the only thing that should matter. And it shouldn't matter what other people think about that. You know, like you get the approval from people who like you and that's it, but you don't have to work for that. You need to work for being uh, the best that you can be period. Um, and that's to me how I always avoid that type of kind of conundrum and that type of situation, that type of frustration. Cause I just don't, you remember music is like, it's not a competition. You know what I mean? Like, and you also have to realize that like things that people are going to like, there's other people that will say this and hopefully you can understand. I feel like I'm repeating other people, but it's nice to get the repetition. Music is entertainment. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, um, music has always been entertainment. It's a form of communication. Yes. But it's it's a communicative entertainment right because all entertainment is a type of communication anyway um but you have to realize that people are listening to music so you have to enjoy what you're listening to and you have to enjoy what you're making which means you have to work to be as good on your instrument or your craft if it's voice whatever in any type of craft as possible or, or production whatever so that you're making music that is enjoyable and it doesn't, a lot of people hear that, especially young students who are like really getting into like more advanced, like harmony and like kind of like getting into more, you know, free jazz and this and that. They're just like, whoa, why should I have to play, you know, like old music? Like, I didn't say that. That's your own insecurities telling you that. You can play whatever you play just needs to be music. That's the point. You can play whatever, if you got an audience for it, you can do it. But people will tell, people can tell right away if it's, if it's contrived. You know what I mean? So if you want to get away from that, no matter if you're playing one note or 15,000 notes, all those notes have to mean something. And that should be the number one goal. And if you do that, then you don't even have to worry about playing for other people because you're not you're not worried about uh, impressing other people. You're not worried about impressing musicians, you know, because like I feel like one of the reasons why we focus so much on impressing musicians is because jazz, because we're taught jazz in this kind of vacuum situation where it's not popular and we have to always fight for it and we have to always like keep it alive and we have to do this and that. It seems like we're only ever talking either with musicians or rich donors. Not realizing that like we're all audience members, right? <laughs> Even the people that are supporting you, they're, they're audience members. So yeah, you should be playing for them, but that doesn't mean pander to everything they want. And just, and yeah, you, you should be talking to musicians because yeah, you, you got to, you got to make sure you everybody's growing and feeding each other, but you don't have to just play technical stuff all the time. It, the point is, both of these people, the people that are supporting you, the donors and the musicians that are supporting you, are all supporting you because you are doing what you love, right? They like and enjoy what you're doing. So you can't focus so much on just trying to impress people. You just got to stay on your journey, man. You got to stay on it and, and, and play what you like. And if you do that, then things will work out because I would not be here talking to you right now if I spent way, way too much time just concerning myself with what other people are doing, you know why? Because there's an endless sea of that. That's never going to stop being a reality. There's always going to be more impressive stuff coming your way every single day. Like it's always going to keep happening. So if you keep concerning yourself with what the hottest new thing is that you need to be impressing with somebody with, then you're never going to run out and you're never going to make time for your own music. That's why, listen, you know me. I, I, I know I'm a sloppy player, man. Like I'm not, I can't do crazy like, so like I can play. I can play fast and stuff. I know I can play, but I can't do super clean studio California kind of, you know, you know, I love my boys, but you know what I'm saying? I can't do super clean, you know, this and that and have, you know, thousand dollar mouthpiece tenor altissimo and stuff like that. Alto altissimo, bit whatever. I can't do any of that kind of stuff, <laughs> you know, because I know what I can do best. But if I concern myself with like, and I don't know nothing about the new mouthpieces. I don't know anything about new saxophones. I don't know anything about new reeds. I know what I'm with. I know what makes me happy. I know what I can play. And I know the music that I'm shooting for. And I'm and I, I love and support all the other musicians that I see doing their thing. And I'm like, that's cool. And I love it. I was like, man, that's really interesting. You know, but at the end of the day, I'm focusing on me. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that's at the end of the day, that's all I'm at. Because you, you, you can't build everybody's house. You have to build your own house. I see a lot of people trying to like put put bricks and wood in other people's houses and they ain't even got their own bed to sleep on. I see a lot of people doing that. 
<laughs> you dig what I'm saying? I see a lot of people doing that on the internet right now, but it's like, you got to have a house, bro. And you got to have a kitchen. You got to have a bathroom. <laughs> you got to have a bed. You know, if you don't have any of that to call your own, if you're not working on that, then like, you're going to spend way too much time trying to copy other people or try to impress other people for validation when you don't really have anything to, to call your, your own. And, and that's important. That's like, I mean, you can look outside of music, you know, where I'm not exactly the most patriotic person, but I'm aware of the American dream. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like people want a house and they want this and that, blah, blah, blah. It's like, why do people want that? Why do people seek that out? Because that's like, that's identity. Because people, because the, the human condition is the search for, for purpose and identity and being able to express that comfortably within a community of other identity seekers. <laughs> and you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about music is that we're constantly enamored with the accomplishments of other people's search for identity, not realizing that they're doing, they're going, they went through the exact same thing that we're going through. <laughs> so uh, this very long winded kind of talk, like, is again, it's just my thoughts. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want you to take anything that I'm saying right now is like me being holier than thou. It's like, this is just stuff that I've thought about. You know, there's just things that like, I spend a lot of time by myself thinking about stuff because I just, I, I'm always searching for the same type of meanings that I think everybody else is you know but I've just like Emmett has I've had you know I've had the pleasure and the uh, the honor like I can't believe we've gotten to the amount of people that we've been able to see and play with as jazz musicians on a journey to kind of help us get perspective in our lives you know where if, if we didn't have that we wouldn't have gotten to this point so we're just trying to do our part I think our duty to to do what they were doing for us and to continue it so that everybody else might be able to help continue this this is this is not about like let's keep jazz alive like no man jazz is an expression of humanity and it's like this is about like jazz is like kind of like it's just human language you know what i'm saying like it's a really deep and advanced form of human communication and we're all just trying to help push that along so uh think about that stuff you know what i'm saying like maybe think about all of that and keep that as your priority and then you won't be so caught up with like you know seeing this million view you know one yeah. 10 second jazz lick <laughs> that's kind of bothering you and, and sending you to, into a depression because you can't play it, you know, like just don't play it. Or like, I don't know, just think about something else. This is more important things than a lick. <laughs> so, you know, oh, I love that. That was such a nice answer. You're, you're always, every time I ask you a question, it's, they say we want more long winded Pat in the chat. That's what everyone <laughs> said. They like it. We're going to transition. Wish, wish for. <laughs> Thank We're going to transition. Cause we got a lot of people who, really are big fans of, you know, your J music stuff. So I got a two part, another two part question for you. First, can you talk about how you got into it and the formation of the J music ensemble? And then we have another group of people asking who, who already are fans of it. Um, how do you kind of see the stuff, you know, and you've studied in terms of more, you know, traditional jazz and the jazz idiom, how do you transition that into J music? And what are the difficulties with that? So two part question. So the, the clearest and most, cause, cause I can spend like four hours talking about this, a really long story, but to the most like clear, like kind of five minute, I guess, kind of uh, explanation of, of that is that I see music, all music that I am into is on a continuum. It's in the same place. Um, I don't separate music by genre in my head when I play it. Like now that might confuse some people because they probably look at like the after you've gone thing or whatever, and then like go listen to Ugetsu or something. And they see contrasting like, but you're switching gears. Like, what are you doing? It's like, well, the reason why I'm able to do that is because the analogy I love giving people is that I have a fridge. It's like, it's a musical refrigerator and like, you know, or freezer, whatever. There's a bunch of stuff. There might be like ketchup next to like the apple pie, which is next to like, you know, a, a chicken leg or something. I'm vegan. I don't eat chicken, but you know, it's like, it might be next, <laughs> it might be next to, all this and that, but I'm not going to take all of it out together, right? Like, it's it's when I need it, I'm taking it out, and then I'm putting it back. Like, I, you might need the ketchup to put over your fries, and you put it back in the fridge, and then, or, like, you got a sweet tooth, so you take out the apple pie, and then you put it back in. You know, that that's how I think about music. Like, it's all in the same place, um, and that's because it all has a... Con the, the, it's all about what I like and what my interests are, and I try to think about what the most honest formation of that, like, what makes that music sound the way it does, Um well, what's the clearest thing? It's like when you make an impression of somebody, like when you want to imitate like a president or you want to imitate like, you know, an actor or something like that, or your best friend, you think in your head, like, what's the quality of their voice? You know, like, and you think like, like you think of a, maybe a famous quote or something like that. So I think about all music like that. And you're probably like, what the heck does that have to do with J music? Well, I want to preface that because this is kind of a way to answer both parts at the same time about how I put, ja put jazz 
into like Japanese music. For those people who don't know what J music is, it's Japanese music. Like, you know, my shirt, like I'm quiet. It's quiet. I mean, scary. Just funny. Like I'm into anime. I'm into video games. Everybody should know that by now. Um, but uh, I'm not putting jazz into it. Jazz is, is my language. It's like you can speak one language and talk about other topics. Right. It's not like I don't need to like I can talk about how I feel about uh, ballet or, you know, the opera without learning how I can talk about how I feel about Shakespeare without literally speaking in Shakespearean English. Like (laughs) you're communicating about something with your thing, right? So I'm communicating about my love for Japanese music through my language of jazz, you know? So I might not be explicitly playing jazz. Like you might go to some of my videos where it's like, it's like, wait, hold on. You said you're playing jazz. What happened? It's like, (laughs) I didn't purport that it was going to be traditional jazz. I'm just saying that I'm a jazz saxophonist. And you can hear everything that I'm doing and trace it back to jazz. So that's 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 the point. There's a lot of people out here saying they play jazz covers and they don't they don't they don't know nothing about bird. Like so, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that. Um, but I'm not purporting that that stuff is like actual jazz. I'm saying that like it is jazz influenced, which is the point. Um, but in terms of how I got into the music, um, I grew up in Hollywood, Florida, um, in the hood. We kind of grew up, you know, with modest means. That's the best way to say it. Um, but there was always an appreciation for different types of like art because in the black community, that's, that's, you know, in, especially towards the church, that's the rock of all of the culture is the music and the stories. So, you know, I grew up in the house with my, you know, my mom loved in the house, in the car, my mom loved listening to holdies, you know, in the blues, my grandma loved the blues and church music. I would, I would go to church and then in the, in the street, I would go outside and people like banging on cars, doom, 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 cat, cat, doom. Like, so I got hip hop in the streets and, you know. Biggie and Tupac was still around when I was a little kid, like very, very like short lived for me because I was really young. But, you know, that was the music that was popular at the time. You know, it was all that stuff like Tribe, Tupac, Biggie, Nas, all that stuff like that was. So I had like a a wide variety. And then my father is Jamaican. So whenever I go to his house, I would have reggae playing. There's so much different music. You know, I didn't get into music from like, you know, I didn't get into music from an academic standpoint. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in the chat that play jazz that might not have grown up with like black music, but you had some kind of music growing up. Like I know a lot of people talk, some of my friends are like, yeah, like there was a lot of classic rock in the house and stuff. I was like, yeah, great. I think there's a lot of examples of people that embrace their childhood music and put it and put it into jazz. You know what I'm saying? And I think, I think Brad Meldow is a great example of that. I love, he's one of my favorite pianos of all time. I love, I love Brad. He's been an extreme influence on me and all of his covers of like his favorite rock stuff is really impactful. And it really, it really touched a lot of us in the jazz community, you know, like 10, 15 years ago when it first dropped. Um, But my point is, is that like, we all have these childhood influences, right? That kind of influence our decisions for what we're going to do. And my biggest childhood influence was the fact that I played video games. You know, I got a a PlayStation one in Christmas of 1998. And that was like, that was kind of game over, man. Like, you know, it was like such a big, that was such a big deal. Um, And then my sister on my dad's side, let me borrow her Sega Genesis. So I was playing uh, Sonic the Hedgehog and I was playing Spyro the Dragon and like all of that stuff was like really big. But then also those y'all nineties kids who grew up in the nineties with me, remember Toonami and Dragon Ball Z at first came on in the United States, uh, like the middle of 1999. Like, and the only reason I remember that specifically is because I remember how old I was when I saw the first episode that I saw, which is on Planet Namek. I tuned in like the end of, I think it was like October, it had to be October. I don't remember the month exactly, but I remember it was like in the fall, the end of 1999. And I was like, what is this? Like, it <laughs> I, basically like the only American stuff I could watch at that point, which is like funny cartoons. Like I love that Ed Nettie and like, you know, Courage and stuff like that. There's Kelly Dog, whatever. But I was, Dragon Ball Z came on. Of course, uh, 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 Roroni Kenshin came on. And then you stayed up a little later, Tsunami Midnight Run. You saw like Cowboy Bebop. You saw Trigun, Outlaw Star. That stuff was all coming on. Neon Genesis Evangelion a little later when I was like 11 or 12. You know, so I kept seeing all this stuff. Um, and that was really impactful for me. So that was like my first encounter with that stuff. And I had no idea it was Japanese. I didn't know what Japan was. But then like, you know, the internet becomes more widespread. Then we got our first computer in 2002. And we finally got dial-up internet, I think. A year later or something like that but i was going to the library to use the internet at that point so by the time i was like 10 i was looking up like sonic like yeah so- sonic music and of course the only music you're gonna find that was being put on websites was like midis so i found like a bunch of sonic midis and and then i looked up like maybe let's let's go check out tenchi muyo midis like what about Rooney kenshin like i was just downloading like 
stuff and I'll put my floppy disk in the library and then take and put all the music on that I could on those floppy disks and which only hold like one and a half megabytes at the time. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like nowadays, if you see an MP3 file as one and a half megabytes, it's probably a virus. It's too small. Right. But like back then, like, you know, it's MIDI file was like 100 kilobytes. Because you can put like 25 or something like that MIDI files on there. So I, I took that floppy, just put it in my, in my computer at home since we didn't have Internet. And I was checking out all that stuff, you know. That's that's how I was get digging into that music, and it really affected me. I know a lot of people are just like, I can't listen to music unless it's like flack. I need like 320 kilobits, or but I was like, you didn't grow up in the LimeWire days, man. Like <laughs> we didn't have a choice of what we got to listen to. <laughs> but it's like I just was interested in the music, right? I didn't care about the fidelity. I just wanted the sound, and so I was really enamored by listening to that music. And I think, um, and then long story short. I went to the library. I found my first manga. It was Rama One Half. That's when it clicked dots. I realized oh, this is all Japanese. Started reading manga throughout and, and watching anime on the internet when you can start streaming stuff. And I think this is like, I started streaming anime in like 2007, 2008. And it was still like kind of slow. Like, you know, the fastest internet was like DSL or something at the time. I don't know. But um, we were streaming anime. So like uh, Naruto was airing in the States. But we had uh, Naruto, the, the episodes like like Shippuden was air, si like simultaneously being uh, played in Japanese only in Japan because it hadn't come to America yet. So we were like reading the manga, watching the anime, all that kind of stuff. And I got really just enthralled with this stuff. But where that normally would stay just like as a thing, right? It was normally just interested. You're just cool. I like anime, whatever. And you go do your real stuff. You do the real stuff, right? You go work your job and go play music, whatever. By the time I got to college, man, I don't know what was happening, but like I, I decided to, you know, I got my first Netflix account and um, I noticed there was anime on Netflix. I was like, wow, like high quality HD anime. That's that's pretty cool. Like I don't have to stream in like low quality 360p or whatever anymore. You know, and then there was a show called Eden of the East and there was a uh, the ending to that show um, was called Futuristic Imagination. I didn't know what it was at the time, but it immediately caught my attention like. Everything that I was learning about music, I, I make I did Grammy band. I don't know if anybody remembers what that is. I did Grammy band, um, the Grammy jazz ensemble. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I did I did that for two years. I met a lot of my best friends that I still know to this day and play with in that band. And I was I felt like the weakest link all the time because I felt like all these cats had new horns or old horns, you know, you know, <laughs> had private lessons, knew all this theory kind of stuff. So I was constantly trying to challenge myself, and my ears were expanding and my knowledge was expanding. So by the time I get to this. You know, I'm not discriminating. I'm like, I'm not like, this isn't swing. I don't care about this music. No, it's whatever music I'm hearing, I'm going to think about it and analyze it. So I hear this song at the end that has elements of every type of music that I've loved. And it's speaking to me in a very specific way. And it was also interesting. It had like some interesting time changes and stuff like that too. And I was just like, what is this? So I looked up more from that band. And because I always liked simple, soulful music, when I heard this there was something that struck me differently about it. I didn't know what it was, but I just kept exploring it. At the same time, I was also learning jazz and man school and music. And years keep going by. The next year, now, same thing happens with... <laughs> I, I go to this video game that I'm exploring called Super Hang On because on my old Sega Genesis. I'm like, let me dust this thing off. I haven't played it in a long time. Put in the cartridge. And after you pick your bike, because it's a motorcycle racing game, you pick your bike, you pick the track, the last thing you pick before you race is you pick the background music. You actually pick the music. This is game is from 1989. You pick the music that is going to be in the background from when you're racing. So I just select one track and I was never good at the game. I told myself like, all right, I'm going to finally get good at this game. So because I kept crashing, like in the first 10 seconds when I was a kid, I never got to hear the actual tracks, but because now I'm, I'm older, I'm a little better at video games. I'm like actually getting a minute into it. into the race. Cool. And all of a sudden two and a half minutes in, I hear this solo. I was like, what the heck is going on? I'm like, what is going on? Like, I'm just like completely like, <laughs> like what? Like, what? What is this hidden in this game? Like, it's, it's just like, stuff. yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, along, yeah, yeah. Outright a crisis. And I'm like, all right, now I got to check out this soundtrack. So that was my first time transcribing a video game solo. So I started like transcribing that. And also it was my first synth solo too that I transcribed. So that kind of helped me. I was just trying to explore whatever because I was already open to listen to whatever kind of music. Eventually I just decided, all right, this is too much. Like this music is giving me way more excitement than like the stuff that's going on around me. Cause it's not like I didn't like jazz. It's just that when I first got to MSM, I felt like the type of the, the way I wanted to play music, it felt like people didn't want to, I didn't know why. Like it felt like, 
like no matter what type of music I wanted to play, I wanted to go hard in it. You know what I'm saying? Like, even if it was soft, like even if it's like a ballad, whatever, like go hard in the ballad. Don't literally bang the drums or something. I mean, like be intense, like be very, I want to like, there's something that I feel from the music I'm hearing, but I feel like no one wants to do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what it kind of felt weird to me. So I always kind of got disillusioned or like disappointed when playing jazz sometimes, unless I play with like my friends that we kind of explore this stuff with. And I don't know if Russell is, is around or anything or watching, but like, he'll know. Cause we, we felt the same way, man. Like, you know what I'm saying? We had a trio back in South Florida, man, where we talked about like, man, we want to play. We just want to play. Right. But so when I was listening to this J-pop and video game stuff, it almost felt like that was built in to the music. Like it felt like the way the music was composed and like the melodies and the sounds, everything, it was meant to be intense, like all the time. And to me, that was like, I needed that. It felt like there was something really relatable about the, the music. And then I realized that, wait a minute, in all of Japanese media, they're not like, it's not just like cosmic horror or like cosmic tales of this and that. It's like very relatable, like the Japanese horror manga, um, the Japanese horror manga uh, uh, author, Junji Ito, he'll make a cat scary or like a window. Like, <laughs> you know, there's like certain like re- things that we think about every day, you know, and for those who don't know, The Ring and The Grudge are also based off of Japanese tales. So like, you know, if you really like those movies and they had a lot of impact, well, they're based off of Japanese stories. So, <laughs> you know, they're not like typical things. But my point is, is that all of this Japanese media seems to be so focused on details, but also very relatable experiences of, of human living. And the fact that the music never strayed away from impactful melodies it feels like jazz musicians are so afraid of the one like the root right like everybody wants to play major sevens and start fours and stuff but nobody wants to play the one and i feel like (laughs) you know like being able to really play stuff that is predictable but be good about it i feel like a lot of people think predictability is bad but it's like no predictability can be really impactful if you lead them up to it and so the people might notice in the way that i play that like yeah I, i can subvert expectations by being predictable <laughs> right and like i have to kind of psychoanalyze like self psychoanalyze myself i guess sometimes and that's the reason why i'm like yeah i can't do a bunch of crazy you know upper structure triad this and that like and you know i can i can play that stuff like i can i've learned it in school but like i don't really i haven't explored that to its limits right like so you, you can't really ask me about stuff like that because i won't be able to answer it but I will be able to give you very impactful melodies because that's the kind of stuff that I study. And that's the lessons that I learned from studying like Japanese music was that it seemed like no matter wh- where I went, if it was a 1920s or 2020, whatever, like all the music kind of had this feeling of like respect, tradition and nostalgia to it. Like even if it was like J-rock, metal, whatever, pop, like commercials, freaking train noises, like the melodies that you can listen to on the train. Like it just seemed so that that's. That's when I started to explore it more and more. And I found a bunch of composers. My favorite composer to this day is Sasakura at UK. And I finally got to record with him last year. I feel like I can, you know, I'm done with music. I can pack it up now. <laughs> but like, you know, of course, I still want to do more stuff with him. But yeah, um, that was kind of what I learned. And uh, um, that's the reason why I decided to explore the music. And then, of course, I started a band at Manhattan School of Music um, because they allowed you to start combos. And I convinced JD <laughs> to let me start a J music combo. And of course, Emmett, you're going to get a kick out of the story. I never, I don't know if I ever told you this, but um, basically when I was, it came time to, you know, get the sign up sheet, whatever, and then pass it in. Like, I want to start this combo. I was like, Hey, I want to start a J music combo. He's like, okay, what's that? So I played him a track from Cowboy Bebop, <laughs> which is basically an all jazz soundtrack. I was like, yeah, this is J music, right? It's like, I feel bad for deceiving him, but you know, it was just like, Oh yeah, that's fine. That's, yeah, that's, that's fine. And then we, we and all of a sudden, like years later, you know, our cover of Polyrhythm by Perfume, <laughs> that of Neely is now one of our popular videos. <laughs> so now we're playing Perfume and like Kyari Pami Pamiu and all this kind of stuff. So that's a video game music. <laughs> but he, he, you know, luckily he trusted me and it, that band put on like, remember, remember it was called Cafe Jazz? Not to yeah. call it Jazz Room Series. Yeah, of Cafe course. Jazz. Yeah, those were like the, the those J music shows were like the biggest shows the uh it, they were always full to capacity as a result oh, so yeah they were just like okay cool and yeah even though it didn't start off exactly the way i wanted to in the beginning it became a thing that i would eventually kind of curate and that's how it became a part of my identity because all those stories and all those melodies really affected me and i and i basically vowed to myself I, this is the kind of thing that i want to do in jazz because i don't see it enough like i like the, the amount of like really storytelling and i'm not saying that like the jazz world in general doesn't do that because of course all of our favorite heroes and masters do this. I just felt like 
why aren't people focusing on that aspect? Why is everybody focusing on like, like these specific minute details, like about like the chords and about the rhythm, about something, but no one's focusing on like the big picture about like these people's playing. And that's like, that's why I kind of got disillusioned. I was like, wow, okay. So, <laughs> you know, so if I'm not exactly swinging, that, is, that means I don't get this stuff. Like, no, the reason why I'm playing all these different types of music is because there's like stories and feelings that I want to get. And that's why it does not matter what music I play as long as I understand the true intent and the, the earnestness behind the music that I play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I'm going to give some other people a chance to, uh, to speak to you themselves and maybe yeah, sure. people on video here. So if you're if you're around, throw your hand up in the uh, your virtual hand in the Zoom thing. If you're ready to come on video, and I'll I'll throw you on. Houston, I'm coming to you. I, you were the first one up uh, a, a bit back, so I hope you're ready. Here comes Houston Patton. Hey, how you doing? Uh, my pleasure to be able to talk to you. Um, so my question is, in a situation where you don't have the ability to play with maybe as many band, like a lot of band members, or there's just not a lot of people to play or play with, especially in college, like my college doesn't have the greatest music program. So I don't really know what to do. I just don't have that experience to play all the time. So, and I was thinking about doing things like streaming and stuff like that, just so I can play for people. But what are some uh i guess uh tips for really putting myself out there kind of by myself at this time mm. yeah that's especially um well actually you know before i say that nice to meet you houston <laughs> great to see you um but i feel like that's especially hard during this time well i guess things are kind of opening back up and now we got new variants of you know the thing like I, I this is gonna go on YouTube I, I believe so like I don't want to say anything that's gonna get Emmett demonetized so I'm not gonna say the word because for some reason YouTubers can't say that word see now it's a good thing that <laughs> see it's a good thing you know I'm a YouTuber so it's a good thing you know I'm aware of that <laughs> you, got I'm the the down. you got all the I know that I got know the rules so I'm not gonna <laughs> get it <laughs> but um yeah the thing that of course has been kind of shutting the world down now there's a new version like a third version now so obviously Things are about to open up now. It's about to close back down. It's like it's getting harder and harder to do the thing that we keep preaching. Like we keep preaching, you got to play with people. Like you got to, <laughs> you know, go out and meet people. Go and do such and such. Blah, blah blah. It's like it's it's getting harder. But at least there's still parts of the the country, I guess, that are still kind of open, right? Especially if you're in the states, which I'm assuming. Um, so because you know I'm from South Florida, and even though South Florida has a a, a great jazz history. Like a lot of people came through there and Cannonball taught down there. Joe Zawano was in, was down there. Like that's how they the Cannonball and them met. Um, it's great. But I really only had like six people that I could really play with. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, and I couldn't always play with them either. And I didn't have my license. It was like hard to meet people all the time, right? But it was the way I learned to play the most. Like, even though I was learning from my teachers and it was great. And like, I know Emmett was doing this kind of thing too. Like, you know, I got to travel, like, or made myself travel. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes you had to just like, like if you if there's people you want to play with, like you see, man, New York is a place. Man, save up some money for a couple of months and then like get a plane ticket and go. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to do stuff like that. Like or like if it's a person like you know maybe LA has a great scene like of of certain type of people you want to meet. All right, we'll go to LA. You know what I'm saying? Like go to these places that you want to meet. Especially nowadays, it's so much easier than like when when we were doing it because like, you know, now we got social media in our pockets. You know, we have so many different ways to keep in contact with people and 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 and, and meet people that we we like and that we want to play with. I think like at a certain point, like even just traveling outside of your city, traveling outside of your state, wherever, like might have to be a thing you do at least once, like for like a week or something. Like I know my life was changed when I first went to New York as an adult. Like I have family in New York, so I went when I was um when I was nine for the first time, but I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't going to Smalls when I was nine years old, you know. <laughs> but like you know I um. You know, that would be a story. Right. But I when I first went there at 17 and then I went to Smalls like because I was doing a recording session with um, the late great Mustafa Sr. And for my first recording session. And yeah, I just got to go there. Then I got to go to Century Ellington. Um, and so we would be going to different concerts with the band or like I would go to jam sessions or like I got to go there again for two weeks during a summer camp. Like that's the other thing. Like you don't even have to just go by, you know, just for nothing. You can actually maybe find some workshops. 
or seminars or like that might have housing or something that you can pay for that might be cheaper than, you know, getting a hotel or something like that. You know, there's there's a whole bunch of different opportunities that you can look up um, to go and kind of find people and meet people to play with. And that might be like an option that you look up because like, yeah, definitely you should stream. That's all. That's like a great thing that we can all do to meet people. But I'm talking about being able to like play with them. Right. And get that experience that of like having real fire under, you know, the behind. Because like, yeah, smalls are still open. You know what I'm saying? They got sessions, all that kind of stuff like that. You can go to these different places and find people to play with. And it's always like, you know, I can't promise that it's always going to be good. That's like the, the luck of the draw but it'll be inexperienced, <laughs> nevertheless, you know what I'm saying? Cause it always depends on the musicians that show up. But the point is you're always going to find people that are ready to play. And that's such an important thing that you can do. Um, and to find, right. Is that you want to find people that are playing, um, at and above your skill level, especially above your skill level. You always want that. Right. And then like, you know, hopefully people that won't vibe you or whatever, but that's, again, I can't promise that that's just reality of the beast, you know? <laughs> so you just gotta just take it, you know, don't, don't be, don't take it personally. Just be like, this is just somebody's thoughts or whatever. I'm going to go home and practice my, my instrument, you know? So I think like, you know, just go whatever city you want to go to or whatever city has people you want to play with, like just hit them up. Now we can hit them up. Now we can find them on, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, all kind of stuff like that. We can find them and and be like hey is it you got any sessions or whatever like whatever and then you might look up and be like oh yeah all right this thing is happening on on thursday so let me get a plane ticket for wednesday stay overnight go to this place and then leave you might just do that and it might be cheap some tickets are like 50 60 bucks you know like so you can you know just get out there that's because that's what the, that's what the music is about anyway right the music is about like reaching over boundaries it's about like the music has gone all over the world we used to hear winton talk about stories you know whenever <laughs> whenever winton would like say stuff like Man, how do we how do we get a group of guys in Timbuktu to play the blues? Like he'll say, <laughs> like he'll say stuff like that, right? And like I love when he would say stuff like that because it, it it kept kind of putting in my head, like man, like he really is trying to get us to understand the universe, the, the universal nature of the music and the language, right? Like, and I think that's what's really cool about nowadays that you can literally make that real by like talking to people and finding people to play with. So you know, you might have to do that because it might be hard in your area just like it was hard in mine you know especially like when i had left new york for when i left florida for the first time and then came back and then everybody was gone like during the, during the summer breaks and stuff i'm just like <laughs> well i gotta travel here i gotta i gotta go back to new york i gotta go find more what's going on out here you know what i'm saying so you might have to do that and that's just the reality is that like and you might find a new home too you might be like okay as soon as i'm done with school i'm going to this place that's what happened to me i was in new york for 10 years you know and now i'm trying to go to japan at the end of next year you know and who knows i might only be there for like a year and then come back I might even come back to New York. I don't even know. And maybe if New York decides to treat me better, <laughs> but we ain't going to talk about that. But yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like you, there's always opportunities and you just have to find ways to take them and uh, kind of bring them back even to your home area. You might have some people that, that that's like what I did from my school at Dillard. Like I went to Grammy band, I went to New York and brought the lessons that I learned from there back to my school. And then we all kind of had this kind of group, uh, 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 like, like kind of, uh, uh, kind of growth together you know so i don't know there's there's many different benefits to traveling that's that's why i always am a big proponent of it so i hope that i hope that yeah, kind of helps it's, it's, helps it's hard but it helps you know I hope, so. <laughs> yeah thank you appreciate it well yeah of course yeah nice to see you all and pleasure talking to you same man thanks houston i'm gonna get another guy on here um let's see i'm gonna get christopher christopher i'm coming to you i hope you're ready Hello? Hey, what's up? I can't see you yet. Sorry, my um my connection might not be really great where I'm at in the house. Okay. I'm not okay. sure. Um, yeah, we can hear you talk. No wait, no, here. I got the let me see. Oh. There I am. Hey. Hey Patrick and Emmett and Brian. I uh, really appreciate everything you guys are doing. I'm going back, back in the log, live at Emmett's place, catching everything. Oh, man. Uh, so having a lot of fun. Um, I, I'm kind of a latecomer. Um, like when I was younger, I was kind of into sports and stuff. But I had uh, like my family, my dad plays guitar. And on both of my parents' sides, musicians. 
on my mom's side, her brother, he actually played bass for Shauna Na. And uh, he, he played at Woodstock. And, wow. you know, it was, it was uh, Hendrix. Hendrix was the one that got Shauna Na there. So <laughs> that's kind of that cool. That is killing. But, wow, and so, like, man. I grew up with music. And, but I was never turned on to jazz. I kind of picked up guitar as a teenager. And then uh, the last year of high school, I was in like a music appreciation class or something. We did like presentations and I did Louis Armstrong. And I think everyone, I mean, you got to love Louis Armstrong. Like it doesn't matter who you are. But then I heard someone did uh, Miles Davis playing So What? And I thought, what is this? This is this is totally different than my, what I... When I think of jazz, like, burp, 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 you know, like Facts. just something like, you know, like like some some like corny 20s kind of, you know, stereotype t- kind of thing. And so when I heard like, um, like, so I thought this is this is different. Um, and I went out and I grabbed like I didn't even know that much, but I grabbed like Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk. I didn't even know what I was doing anyway. So now I'm kind of picking up the saxophone later in life. And I wanted to know, what do you suggest to people that are self-taught musicians? Because, you know, I I didn't grow up around playing with people and and I've always been a self-taught musician. So what do you have advice have people like that, especially, with jazz okay you you were cutting out a little bit but i think what i garnered from your question was like how, what do you recommend to self-taught musicians like on like on saxophone and learning jazz um so i was actually talking about that i do a, i run a q a on my uh on my channel every sunday on twitch as well um i do a, a i used to do a thing called sunday jazz school but what I was talking about there, someone asked a pretty similar question, um, but it was about like, how do I get soulful in music, whatever. So I'm gonna give you kind of the same answer because I think it applies here as well. Um, I'm a big proponent of the chaos order approach. Um, I feel like a lot of people teach from order chaos and or like they teach order only and then they find out about chaos and then they want to get chaotic. I think a good opportunity for you, especially since you're older now, um, this is something that like uh, I think kids do naturally just because they want to be chaotic, but they have to be restrained. But because you actually are an adult now, you have a, a, a well-rounded at this point um, understanding of the world more than you did when you were a kid. Um, just pick the thing up and have fun with it first. Like <laughs> make sure that that's like the number one thing. Like it may sound stupid for me to say it, but like you're going to, you're going to thank yourself for doing it later. If you do that, because a lot of people end up starting saxophone or starting any instrument where they learn very routine techniques and that's it. And then like 10 years later, they hear, I don't know, like cannonball or something. And just like, man, like, how do you do that? Whatever. It's like, I didn't grow up in the church. Like, how do I do such and such? It's like, well, the thing that that kind of stuff teaches you is kind of how to be uh, free, wild, expressive. And if you're not able to be elastic, then you won't be able to, con- it's easier to control the elasticity than to expand the tension. You know what I'm saying? So just like, you know, Learn scales, obviously, the things that you already know about guitar, learn those things on saxophone, but you don't necessarily have to to bog yourself down with specific techniques unless you have like a, you know, I say go find a teacher that can help you with those things. That's great. You should. But like, you know, make sure you're practicing sound is extremely important. That's the number one thing. You know, make sure you have a good sound conception. I'm going to say that every saxophone player asks me a saxophone question. Like, I don't care how many notes you can play in a bar. If they don't sound good, I'm turning the record off. So focus on sound. And that's why I talk about the chaos approach, because, you know, there might be certain techniques you want to do on the saxophone. Right. And you need to have the idea of what that sound is first. So, you know, kind of fool around with it, kind of scream into the horn, growl, whatever. Move your fingers fast. That's what my band director told me. And then eventually, once you have that idea, find some form to it by understanding what the right way to do it is. So try to take it backwards, in my opinion. Because saxophone is a vocal instrument. This thing is so weird. It's a freaking clarinet mouthpiece on like a tuba. That's like, that's, that's like, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what the Ophicle, you know, that's what the original saxophone was, was basically something like that. So there's no real right way to play this thing anyway. It's all different people's approaches. So you should like understand what people's general idea of the right thing to do is. But like, number one is like, make sure you just learn the basics, like your scales, 
you know, uh, long tones, patterns, all that kind of stuff. And but, you know, put form to the chaos. So think about that as you go on your journey. I think it'll help you a lot more. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Patrick, man, you've been you've been doing an incredible job. I wanted to ask, I just want to step in and ask something. Um, just just more about like the actual playing of the instrument. <clears throat> um, one one thing that, that I think we all try to do is to to really imitate. Um, and what I think makes makes you so original is the fact that you're able to imitate a lot of saxophone players. I was wondering if, if you'd be open to just picking up the horn and, and just and just giving a brief, uh, you know, just 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 a brief overview of, of just a three, four saxophone players, Cannonball, Bird, uh, Paul, you know, Paul Gonzalez. No, I mean, uh, Johnny Hodges, uh, people like that who, who you've spent a lot of time listening to. It and, you know, it goes back kind of to the first question where people asked, you know, what, what, what do you try to get from a transcription? And I think you capture the spirit of all those people so well, but never overdo it in any kind of way. It's so natural. And we haven't had any playing from you yet. So I thought maybe we could just kind of round out this 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 session with that. And then I think Brian has one last thing. I'm gonna okay. do a flash round, but if you if you can, thanks. Sure, yeah. Um pardon, because this re I was didn't I didn't realize I was gonna play. This read is very old. <laughs> It's like, I don't know, I'll try to. So I talked about some of my main influences being like Charlie Parker, uh, Cannonball, but also I have to talk a lot about John Coltrane because that was like a really groundbreaking uh, uh, revelation for me as well. Um, of course, once I got into, co into high school uh, and I was at Dillard um, Center for the Arts, I had to play a lot of Johnny Hodges because we were playing Duke Ellington's music. So I had to, if I was playing lead, I got to understand that. Also, I had to understand Marshall Royal. Um, from Count Basie Orchestra, uh, Jerome Richardson from Thad Jones. I had to learn a lot of different styles. So like, but it wasn't because I was trying to like imitate. It was because I want the music to sound good. So a lot of people kind of get the wrong idea. Not you. I'm saying a lot of people get the wrong idea about like, oh, you have to sound exactly like this. Like, I'm not copying when I'm emulating these musicians. Like, it's not like, like the reason why it might sound a certain way, but it won't sound like I'm exactly doing the thing is because I'm, my goal is not to, copy somebody my goal is to make the music sound like what i want it to sound like because i think this thing sounds if i'm listening to like like i i, I think about that way down to tempo too like i think tempos of songs are important right like hey we count basically always say it like you know, there's only one right tempo and it's like the right tempo right it's always one only one right tempo for the song it's the right tempo you know whatever that quote was but basically um i just want to preface the playing by saying that whenever i'm like, I don't know of any specific techniques so like to imitate somebody because what I'm doing is I'm thinking of what the most essential sounds of the music are and like how it, you know, and like what's in a note, like what is in a note, right? Like I can play one note. <laughs> Matter of fact, on alto, there's like two notes people love to play. So like, especially from that time, it's like B and D. I can play those notes. I can play that note in like four different ways and you can tell me who saxophone, like who that might be. Like, that's like a cannonball D. That's like Benny Carter, Don Redman, kind of early D. We're like a, it's like a bird D. We're like, you know, it's, all right, that's like a Johnny Hodges D. You know, I'm, this is like concert, right? So it's like, it's B on saxophone. But like, I'm thinking about what, like, I'm using my imagination. What is the sound? <laughs> like, what is the what is the character and the characteristic of the sound? And I'm using my imagination to like, I, I don't know how to. Again, I, if you don't have imagination, it's gonna be real hard for me to explain to you. But like, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about. It's like when you imitate somebody, like you know, like I'm I'm not wrong, I'm right, I'm right. you know, saying when people do impress persons of like people like that, you know, homeboy, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying like you know, you think about. How do you imitate somebody? Well, you got to think about what, what is the, the most characteristic thing about them that you can remember? And so for me, I'm like, what is, what is the core essence of their personality that I'm hearing? So like, you know, like. Like, 
Like when I'm thinking of like, you know, I'm just like, there's like a man, what is like what is this warmth? What is this like? What is this thing that Bird is able to do that like nobody else does, right? Or like, you know, uh it's like there's a certain all right there's a joy that now there's a there's a bounce there's a joy in, in this thing now that i gotta do okay well what about like So now I'm thinking there's a certain like royal regal feeling to his playing. Like it's like a really majestic type of thing. Right. So I'm like these are words, but words don't accurately describe, you know, what I mean, like words don't really describe the image that's in my head. I'm just trying to give you like a snapshot idea of what's going on when I'm thinking of the players. I'm not thinking like, oh, like, OK, so on like the G7, uh, uh, the way he plays the 13th, he kind of bends the things like. You think he was thinking about that? I don't care about that stuff, dude. Like when you, th you know, when you're trying to imitate like a, a, a famous celebrity, are you thinking, oh, you know, when he speaks, like, I think his tongue is kind of like on the cleft palate look, but maybe way his teeth are, no, you ain't think about that. You just, you just do something. Like it might not be right. I'm not saying that this is the best imitation or whatever. I don't care. I just know that I'll, like, I'm thinking about the horn the way I'm thinking about my voice. That's what's important. So I want to do, I want to break through whatever limitations are there you know, to, to get that. And I know you talk about imitating famous players, but I want to talk about imitating the voice because to me, that's the thing that led me to being able to do the things that I do is the voice. So learning how to sing or like actually thinking about singers, Ella is like one of my favorite singers of all time. I think she's like probably my favorite jazz singer. Um, but I think Ella, Anita O'Day and Sarah Vaughn, they're like really, really great singers for me that I've taken a lot in terms of how I play. Um, but if I want to go, hey, hey, right? Like, like it's it's like I'm using side D, right? I'm not using one, two, three, one, two, three, because that's a closed sound. Ooh, ooh, ah, ooh, I'm like, ah, I'm like, what's ah, what's that? What's the church ah? Like, ah. Like, okay, that's side D. You know, so I'm 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 thinking about, I'm not thinking about like techniques. I'm just like, what like the idea leads me to the technique. Right. The idea. So I'm kind of using the saxophone is almost like a toy, you know, that you're playing with, you know, and it, it, and if it looks and feels that way, that's because it's true. Like I am literally playing with the instrument like it's 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 not like this thing that I'm like, I must, you know, like, you know, it's like, yeah, I can do that. But it's like I'm not it's it's about the instrument being literally it's people think people hear this so much. They think it's a cliche. You know how many times people say the instrument should be an extension of your body or an extension of your voice, man, just because like, you know, you, you, your 60 year old auntie or whatever is like telling you something and you don't want to hear it. Cause you're 16. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You've been hearing it so much. Cause you hear how everybody says it. Like, think about that. Think about the reason why they're saying that to you. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's because it literally is an extension. Like it should feel that seamless. And the only way you're going to get to that is by like understanding, um, understanding like the, the, the feeling of breaking those limitations by starting with your voice. So all of that stuff, when it comes to bird, cannonball, I just train, you know, you know, all, all of that stuff, all of that stuff, it comes from the imagination. So I'm, I'm using my imagination to break through the limitations to see this more as like a blank slate than like a, a limited, thing of keys you know so thank you man patrick you have given us so much in this last hour and 10 minutes or so i won't be mindful of your time but i want to get as many people's questions in here as fast as I'm, possible i'm chilling i'm more worried about y'all time i'm sorry that <laughs> i end up talking so much <laughs> no, no, we really love it everybody loves it we got a lightning round this is how we're maybe going to start oh. ending things here just uh so this is the opposite of uh, okay. the answers you've been giving now. We want one to two words and you got to fight the instinct to, to give more. 
I got yeah. a ton of questions from people and we're going to get everyone in here. One to two words as best you can. Here we go. Who was your favorite? Who was your teacher at Manhattan School of Music? Who was my teacher at Manhattan School of Music? Yeah. Uh, I had Steve Wilson. And uh, for the first two years, and then I had Joe Temperley for the second two years. All right. Uh, what's your favorite standard? <laughs> I thought these questions were supposed to be easy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that one always gets asked. And then I think last week someone gave five answers and I was like, yeah, because how am I supposed to give my favorite? <laughs> that means that all the rest of them are underneath. Uh, okay, let me think about what I play the most. Let me think about what I like playing. Yeah, tell, that's, that's tell them what's your least favorite song now. <laughs> no, actually, no. I think I have, I have, it's, it's going to be a toss up. My two favorites. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll see you in my dreams. Hmm. Uh, or just one of those things. <laughs> you know, this, this one's a, a theory kind of question. You have a, do you have a favorite chord? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You love them all. <laughs> I mean, I, I used to like have like I was really obsessed with sh major seven sharp 11s when I first heard them. OK, but I don't okay. think about chords like that. No, sorry. Do you have uh, any plans to be do a gig in Boston in 2022? Uh, if you call me, you got the money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, what are the instruments you play? I started on clarinet. Uh, I still like to play, but I don't really play anymore. I play this thing, play flute. Um, more recently, the quarantine's giving me time to play it. Tenor, soprano, this is more than one word, but you asked a bunch of, you asked a yeah, no, question that's going to have a bunch of answers. Uh, play some piano. I play maybe like one 17,476th of piano that Emmett plays. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I play some drums. <laughs> I'm ready on the drums. I was going to say, don't leave out. Ah! <laughs> is your mouthpiece custom or stock? I actually don't know. I think I guess it's stock. I gotta ask Kyle. So I, I yeah, I don't I don't know about gear. What's your favorite video game soundtrack? Mm, these are supposed to be easy questions, man. Oh I know it's tough when you get into the favorites. I know. Uh can I get you top three? Top three. Yeah, of course, of course. Even that's hard. Even that's hard, man. Because I know I'm gonna be when I I know You're when I'm leave on something spot, out. Man. Yeah, when I'm put you on the spot, that. it's hard for me to all right. Um in no order. No order at all. Uh, Nights into Dreams. Um, uh, <laughs> oh my god, Nights into Dreams, Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Oh, this is so hard. Oh my god, oh my god. Um, <laughs> Spyro the Dragon. <laughs> I think maybe people are asking these just to see you struggle too. So, Zelda's too yeah, obvious, no. huh? What, Emmett? Zelda's too obvious. Well, I, I didn't really play the Zelda games that much, but I do love Ocarina of Time. It's, it's definitely in there. That soundtrack is unbelievable. Uh, in terms of games you play, someone's asking, do you, what's your favorite Pokemon game? Oh, Gen 3. That's the easiest question that I could ever answer. <laughs> all, right, all right. So far. <laughs> we got someone tuning in from Japan. They said, what, you have a favorite jazz hangout in Japan? Yeah. Hmm. Tabun... Intro. Intro uh, club intro. Uh, intro in, in Takada no Baba. I love it. Everyone loves intro. <laughs> um, do you have a, I guess you kind of answered this, but do you have a most favorite song to play at the moment? I gotta go back and look at my my warm up sheet because I because I have I have like I have like uh, like uh, I do warm ups on my streams. Um, favorite song that I like to play at the moment. Uh, I know I gotta give an answer. Uh. I want to talk about you. <laughs> That's a favorite standard, but I, I I don't play jazz by myself. <laughs> Oh, by yourself. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I know when I ask Patrick what he wants to play, he's, you know, it's that, that's yeah, it. because that song. Yeah, I love that. That yeah, I don't know why I didn't say that for standards, but like I get that. That song always gets me. It's that's the first song that I learned. Uh, let's just say that I love playing that. Like I love because I, I, that's Billy Eckstein destroys me every time I hear that song. So let's let's say that. 
Oh, I can always play I Want to Talk About You. That song is just, woo. <laughs> yeah, so let's say that. <laughs> uh, Leo's asking reading versus or learning by ear. <laughs> I thought you said lightning round, man. This ain't lightning round. Both. If okay. You can, if you can, both. Well, one of your favorite anime OSTs? The people love the the Japanese stuff. So while we got you here, I don't think anybody else we're going to have on here is going to be able to answer these. Anime OSTs. Oh, my gosh. Uh, maybe not. In a, I was going to say darker than black. Uh, I mean, obviously, Cowboy Bebop is up there, but that's too obvious. I do like Cowboy Bebop. Man, the Bruce Faulkner soundtrack, the Dragon Ball Z, bro. Mm. Like, I can't front. Like, I can't be I can't skip the op that. That both the Japanese and the American uh OSTs of Dragon Ball Z are top tier, like they both really and also I love the Naruto soundtracks. I don't know, those are my favorites. So, <laughs> so I think okay, last one, good. last one. You got a book recommendation for everyone? Yes. Um uh, Daily Rituals by Mason Curry. Mm. It, it's 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 a uh um it's a book that's basically a catalog of different like either interviews or like eyewitness accounts or whatever from like people they knew of like famous artists writers dancers filmmakers musicians he's talking about like, from beethoven to like louis armstrong to kirkengard to to to, to uh, uh murakami ravel melt like, like like so many different people in their daily rituals what they did when they woke up in the morning to when they went to bed great book wait emmett do you actually have it is he about to grab it? Like, cause I had, cause I, I have it in, in storage. That's that's it. That's it right there. You remember uh, when that book came out? Everybody yeah, was yeah. talking about it, bro. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some someone got got this for me. For me, it's oh, really? that's actually a crazy thing thing to read. Whatever all those guys did. <laughs> yeah, man, I love it. Hearing how like Beethoven was like a terrible like apartment tenant and stuff like that, like freaking yeah. pacing around the floor, washing his hands over the like f the water would seep through the floorboards, and everybody was so mad at him and stuff. It was really fun, and, and you know, and then hearing stuff like Glenn Gould like waking up at like four or five in the morning like every day to like either to practice or and then like oh I teach by this like you hear what Chopin did. I would teach by ten a.m. I would walk out you know, for lunch at 12 or whatever, pace myself. And then I would compose from one to three or something, you know, like it, it's, it was really cool for, I think it's a, it's a, it's a book that everyone should get because especially for musicians, we're trying to figure out like what our routine is. Cause we don't always have nine to fives. Like what do we actually do with our life? What are we going to do with our schedule to make it more, you know, like we don't have to copy them, but it's nice to see what other people did, you know, and like kind of get different perspectives on how we should, you know, what we should be doing or how we can make better use of our time. I thought it was a really cool book. So. I sometimes used to have it like and read it like every time I woke up or like went to bed, like just kind of reading it. This is really nice. I recommend that book. All right, I lied. We have one more. Some some people want mm -hmm. to know. You got a favorite young saxophonist in your generation? Oh, you really exposing me, man. I don't I do not do enough. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, but it depends on how young. I mean, not I don't want to shut well. nobody out, but I mean, I might seem a little biased by saying this. Um Mostly because people used to say that we looked alike and had the same horn, or whatever. But I love Emmanuel, man. I just, I just love like Emmanuel Wilkins. Yeah. I just, I don't know. He's, he's always been like kind of like my brother in the scene. And if he sees this, yeah, I, I hope that he, he knows that I'm extremely proud of like all of the the work and accomplishments that he's done. I feel like he's almost like, <laughs> I feel like you know, with all all the drama surrounding like me and the jazz scene or whatever, I feel like he's shot way beyond. To like what I feel like I could have done or, or I'm doing in the jazz scene at all. And it really makes me happy to see like how, how far he's been pushing like independently himself with his own playing. And I, I don't know, I'm just down for his journey. There's a lot of other young saxophone players that I love and I love listening to, um, you know, but again, you told me to give you one name. So that's one of them that I think I'm really, uh, really proud of his journey. And I, and I hope he continues to do well. Love you, man. Absolutely. Well, Patrick, that's the end of our time here. I just want to say thank you so much for, for joining us. You, you gave so much, a lifetime of information in this short time. And thanks to everyone for your questions. You know, we kind of jumped all over the place and uh, it was all, it was all beautiful and all very insightful. So thank you. I want to say thank you to Adam R. Rose for sponsoring this, this first wave of Zoom masterclasses. We really appreciate it. Thanks to all of you for tuning in here on Zoom and thanks for everyone for engaging on Facebook and YouTube too. If you were asking questions on there and wondering why we weren't seeing them, 
we are, we're only really looking at the Zoom participants. So next time, you know, we're, we're trying to do this every couple of weeks now, I think. Make sure you sign up um, at emmettcohen.com slash education, and then you can join the Zoom. It's completely free because it's sponsored by Adam. Um, but we'll see you next time. And uh, thank you again to Patrick for making this what thank it is. Thank you, man. Thank you all. Appreciate it. All right. See you later, everyone. Thanks so much, Patrick. Thank you, bro.